Charles C.W. Cook, my friend, it's been too long. I'm so glad to have you again with me here on the Will Cain Podcast. I hope we can do this more in the future. But today, you were the perfect guy, not at first glance, but because I know you deeply, and anybody who's ever read your work knows that you are the perfect guy to speak to the United States Constitution's Second Amendment. And the minute you open your mouth, for anyone that doesn't know you, they're going to wonder why. What is it about an Englishman that makes him such a fan of the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution? Well, I changed my mind on it. I mean, if you'd had me on when I was a kid or 15 years ago, I I would have given you a bunch of different answers. But um, I'll give you the most English answer I can as to how this happened. When I was at uh, university, I studied the American Revolution. And part of that was the eventually the ratification of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And I went really deep into the weeds on the Second Amendment. And uh, I found it fascinating. And I realized that this is pre Heller, that the, uh, the narrative that the press spins about this, all of that militia clause stuff is nonsense. And uh, so I wrote my thesis about it. And then from that moment on, I was interested in the topic. And as I learned more, I changed my mind. And I eventually came to be someone who's not only pro Second Amendment in, in legal theory, but uh, in practice as well. So you wrote your thesis on the origins, the intention of the Second Amendment, and you just you just um, dismissed that militia nonsense. So what is it? What is the purpose of the Second Amendment? The purpose of the Second Amendment is to protect the right of the people to keep and bear arms, which is, of course, the language that made it into the Constitution. It's, it's really not as complicated as uh, as the press would have you believe. I watched yesterday this interview uh, with Justice Scalia, uh, and uh, he was asked, you know, was that a difficult decision? And he laughed. He said, no, it was one of the easiest ones, and it should be for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's actually not that confusingly written. Uh, the people in the Bill of Rights means the people everywhere else. Uh, the right of the people to keep in bear arms shall not be infringed is one of the more straightforward sentences. The prefatory clause is common for the time, as Eugene Volokh has, has pointed out. Um, but it's also really not very difficult because there's no contemporary uh, analyst who believes that it's anything other than an individual right. It's not as if there are people in 1810 saying, of course, this is a right to join a militia. No, it's not there in the 18th century. It's not there in the 19th century. This is a mid 20th century invention. Uh, the right to bear arms had come from Britain. It had been exercised in the colonies. Of course, if you were a Native American or if you were black, it was probably taken away from you. The history of gun control and the history of racism are very closely intertwined. And then when you get to the post-Civil War period, the radical Republicans uh, who wrote the 1866 Civil Rights Act, the Freedmen's Bureau Act, and the, the 14th Amendment were extremely clear about their desire to make sure that freed slaves uh, and blacks who were to enjoy all the civil rights that whites did should enjoy the Second Amendment. They say so explicitly when they're debating it in Congress, when they're writing it, when they're sponsoring it. Uh, and so forth. So, you know, I mean, it, it might sound crazy to people in England. It did to me when I was a kid. But the, the purpose of the Second Amendment is to protect people's right to own firearms and uh, under certain circumstances carry them. And you just what you did is you defined the Second Amendment as an individual right, distinguishing it from the argument made today that what the founders had intended was the ability for everyday American citizens to join a militia and wield arms when a part of that militia. So you have laid out for us that the intent was not that, but it was rather an individual right. What, what would the founders mindset have been beyond the literal laying out the framers' words as you just as you just recited them, what would have been their understanding of why we have the Second Amendment? Was it about hunting? Was it about self-defense? Was it about a protection from tyranny? Well, it was about all those things with hunting being the least important. Hunting is sort of an ancillary benefit, although obviously if you're living on the frontier or you're living in a, 
uh, undeveloped part of a new continent, then of course you're going to need a gun because it won't just help you for self-defense. It will help you for sustenance as well. Uh, but this wasn't about hunting. Uh, you know, if you go back to the 6th century and the Emperor Justinian, uh, you will see the first uh, cognizable entry into law of the right to keep and bear arms uh, and of the right to use that um, weapon uh, to defend oneself. Now, obviously, we're not talking at that point about guns. Uh, we're, we're talking about uh, daggers, swords, knives, uh, and so forth. Um, in Britain in the 17th century, the Parliament passes uh, a Bill of Rights, uh, which protects uh, the right of the people uh, to keep arms, providing they're not Catholic. Um, a lot of those people end up in the United States, and they bring with them the English common law and many of the presumptions uh, of the country that they left. Uh, you know, people don't realize this because it's all this focus on the Second Amendment. Uh, maybe it means this, maybe it means that. Oh, was it invented in 2008? But of course, the Second Amendment's the right to keep and bear arms in the context of the federal constitution. But 45 of the 50 American states have their own right to keep and bear arms. So even if the Second Amendment disappeared tomorrow, 45 out of 50 states would still have a right to keep and bear arms. In the state I left, Connecticut passed its own in 1818. Pennsylvania is the first one in 1776. And Alaska adds the Second Amendment into its constitution verbatim uh, in 1959. Uh, the, the concept that uh, human beings should have the capacity to defend themselves and the government, which we'll come to in a minute, if uh, necessary, was just not controversial uh, in colonial America or in revolutionary America. It was, it was assumed. Now, if you look at a lot of the wording of these provisions, they say in defense of themselves and the state. That's the uh, Pennsylvania one from 1776. Vermont adopts the same one in 1777. Why the state? Well, because there's no standing army and there's no police. The American founders were extremely nervous about the prospect of having a professionalized army that would always be uh, ready because they thought that it might be used to tyrannize the people. And so they did want people to uh, own arms so that if they were called up by the militia, which meant everyone, every able-bodied male, um, they could be done, uh, they could do so. But they also ex acknowledged the pre-existing right. Um, that right they thought was unalienable, that right they thought could be applied. And if you read the, the sort of philosophical underpinnings of this, people like John Locke, you'll see there's no distinction drawn at the time of the founding between fighting a tyrant who tries to break into your house, fighting a tyrant who tries to terrorize your town, and fighting a tyrant from an invading army. They're all the same thing, because there is no standing army and there is no police force. So it was just assumed as part of life. You've piqued my curiosity, and I hope I, I doubt that I have, but I hope I haven't pushed your knowledge beyond its limits. What are the five states that haven't enshrined something like the Second Amendment in their state constitutions? Uh, well, California is one of them. <laughs> um, New York is another. Uh, I believe Hawaii. Um, I don't know. I don't know all of them, um, but it's rare. Uh, maybe New Jersey is another one. Uh, it's rare. A and almost every single state that has one within those 45 uh, had it before the Heller decision in 2008. So again, you get this argument, well, Scalia just made this up. Now, that's not supported at all. But if he did, he was a time traveler because he'd have had to go back into those 45 states and write down the same thing in their constitutions, often more explicitly for the last 200 years. So you've referenced Heller a couple of times, and for anyone that doesn't know, so Heller is the Supreme Court decision that did acknowledge that the Second Amendment is an individual right, not one, as we pointed out, that is reserved for those who serve in a militia. Now, you said several times that one of the purposes of the Second Amendment, looking into its history, looking into the founders, the Federalist Papers, looking into John Locke, was um, – a the ability to organize a militia in place of a standing army. Now, I think for a gun control advocate, Charles, they say, well, that necessity has expired. We don't need that. Mm -hmm. We have police forces. We have standing armies. But you're going further than that. and You're saying, but that was just one of the forms of tyranny that the founders acknowledged. They acknowledged many forms of tyranny that the Second Amendment was intended to provide some type of protection. Including against the government itself which, of course, they don't want to happen. 
uh, and they put down the first time there's any risk of it happening with the Whiskey Rebellion, but that was not alien to them because they were violent revolutionaries who'd just beaten the British Empire, and they understood and, in fact, mentioned in the Federalist Papers and elsewhere uh, the, the need to provide a system within which the people, if necessary, could overthrow the government. And I think the point about the militia expiring is a fair one. And there are some states, in fact, Florida, for example, where militias are illegal. But the militia clause is explanatory only. It's not operative. It has no legal force. What it says is, because this is uh, the best way of securing a free state, and in some ways it's drawing a distinction between having a standing army, then the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It's almost like saying, you know, because it's important to keep people informed, then Congress shall make no law respecting the press. Um, it, it, it doesn't need to be there in order to be, uh, to be operative. And if you go back uh, to the time of the founding um, and the ratification of the Second Amendment, you can see that because when James Madison is writing his original 10 amendments, in fact, there were 12, they rejected two, he doesn't know at the time that they'll be uh, appended at the bottom of the document as we now do it. He doesn't know they'll be called the Bill of Rights and treated as this separate entity. Um, what he thinks is that they will be inserted into the text, that they will be put uh, in places uh, that already exist in the Constitution. Uh, much like you might amend a statute by striking out lines and adding new ones. Uh, and he makes a note uh, that the Second Amendment, which started as the Fourth Amendment, uh, will be put into the part of the Constitution that already exists, uh, that already contains individual rights. So the unamended Constitution has a place where it protects habeas corpus and it, no, you know, no ex post facto laws, that kind of thing. He wants it put there. If it had been in intrinsically linked to the militia, of course, he would have wanted to put it into the militia clause, which already exists in the unamended constitution. If it was explanatory um, or, or in inextricably attached to that provision, that's where he would have put it. But it's not. It's, it's an individual right. It's put into a bill of rights. It's within the first eight amendment, which relate to individual rights. Right. And I'll just finish on this by saying, of course it is, Will, because it, not only does it say uh, right of the people, um, uh, to, to keep and bear arms. Um, but the idea that it protects something else doesn't make much sense. What would it protect? The right of an individual to join a state-run organization over which the federal government has plenary power and can exclude them. Uh, what is that? It's lunacy. Okay, I like so many of the things you've said. So, And I, one of the ways that I learn, uh, Charles, is to repeat things back with you having the ability to correct me where I get it wrong. But so, in other words, if we scratched out with a red pen in order to form a militia, or in your example, your analogy, in order to have an informed populace, it wouldn't change the fact that the right, right. still exists to have a free press or to keep and bear arms. It's simply an explanatory, almost parenthetical in that sentence, that if we redlined it wouldn't change the point of the sentence second thing is the context i love you putting this into context in the previous episode of this podcast charles i talked about dave portnoy of whom i'm a fan at barstool talking about the constitution as though it's um it's ancient and no longer applies to today but that viewpoint to me charles is one where the speaker thinks the 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 Constitution and the thoughts in the Constitution are a specifically captured moment in time instead of a a a, a meeting point of thousands of years of, to your point, common law or, you know, Western philosophy, enlightenment, Greek rational tradition arriving at what is individual rights. And that's the final context you put this in every one of the amendments in the Bill of Rights or rather every one of the. The uh, yeah, the amendments in the Bill of Rights are individual rights. Why would they out of the blue inject one that had to do with some state militia? Yeah, they're also very carefully written. If you look at them, for example, uh, the First Amendment does not say newspapers; it says press. It doesn't say letters or uh, town hailers. It says uh, speech. It doesn't say Christianity, it says religion. The Fourth Amendment refers to effects, not candles. It refers to papers, not parchment. And the Second Amendment refers to arms, 
Now, there is some question as to what constitutes arms, but it's not too difficult to go back and look in law dictionaries of the time, particularly Black's Law Dictionary, which has a definition of arms. And that definition includes pistols and carbines. Well, a Glock 17 is a pistol and an AR-15 is a carbine. And you know, one can just apply a pretty straightforward originalist framework and say those weapons are by default uh, included because you know, it doesn't say muskets. I know some people wish it said muskets, but it doesn't. It says arms. And arms at the time was a broad category that already included all sorts of weapons that were more sophisticated than, uh, than a musket. So what is your argument then? If we acknowledge that at least one of the intentions of the First Amendment I'm sorry, the Second Amendment is to provide a protection for the people against a tyrannical government. And you point out it's tyranny much larger than simply against your governing body. But if that is one of the points, people say, well, what are you going to do with an AR-15 when the government today has nuclear bombs? Joe Biden makes that argument Um, when the government flies F-16s and drops nuclear bombs. And setting aside the fact that the Ukrainian war has sort of poked a hole in that argument – What do you say to the people that say the founders never intended, and by the way, you couldn't if you wanted with your rifle, resist a tyrannical government? Well, uh, I would say two things. First, that even if that were true, the Constitution is still in force. And until it's amended, uh, its provisions must be respected by uh, the government and upheld by the court. Uh, And second, I would say I don't think it is true. I mean, I don't think we can put Ukraine aside. Uh, We don't need Ukraine, of course. We we can look at uh, countries that have been in direct conflict with the United States military in recent years. Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam. And I'm not thrilled about this as an American citizen. uh, But we didn't do particularly well in those places against guerrilla forces. And unless you think that the United States government is going to be Uh, in a horrendous situation we're imagining here, uh, more brutal against its own people uh, than it was willing to be in Iraq or Vietnam or Afghanistan, which I don't, then I think those cases are instructive. Remember, we're we're not just talking here about conquering. Uh, We're talking here about ruling, governing. Uh, And uh, it's a fact of history that well-armed insurgencies with small arms uh, unless the aim is one-time annihilation, are impossible to govern. Uh, and I don't think that would be any different in the United States. In fact, I think Americans would probably be the most impossible to govern uh, of, of all. Uh, and I don't think that the American government would be more brutal against its own people than against foreign adversaries. And as evidence for that, I'd point to the British Parliament, which at the time of the American Revolution uh, soured on the war, felt embarrassed by it, and uh, you know, ended up with one third of British MPs being against it and in favor of a settled peace. Now, imagine uh, we're not talking about a country 3,000 miles away, uh, but you know, a country... Uh, well in the same country, which is what would happen. So um, I I just don't buy that argument at all. But staying on that same line, then one could argue from the other side, well, then the American people need much more powerful arms. Um, Does the Second Amendment confer upon you a right? Here's Joe Biden's uh, favorite one, to own a cannon. Um, But, you know, more specifically, you know, serious does the Second Amendment, and you began to give us a definition of arms as in the, the framer's intent, how far does the Second Amendment go? Does it allow me to own a nuclear weapon? Well, at the time of the founding, there's a distinction drawn in language and law between arms and ordnance, which they spell without the I, ordnance. And uh, ordnance in, is bombs, essentially. Uh, and arms is, and the definition is, uh, it's not perfect, but essentially anything that you can use to defend yourself with which you can discriminate. So a gun, um, a dagger, a, it, does a bazooka count? Well, that's where it gets tough. Does a grenade count? That's where it gets tough. But it certainly wouldn't have included the equivalent of nuclear weapons. Um, now, uh, aside from that, aside, uh, you, you have a, a status quo in which an awful lot of people owned some pretty heavy weaponry at the time of the founding. Cannon, warships. If you look at the section of the Constitution that deals with letters of mark and reprisal, it simply assumes that there's going to be a lot of Americans who have their own ships, <laughs> who could take them over and fight. Um, 
I don't think that means that those uh, are necessarily protected by the Second Amendment. No one at the time talks about those as being included. But it does mean that the founders uh, were pretty comfortable with Americans being armed to the teeth. Uh, and finally, on Joe Biden's point, uh, he keeps saying this about Cannon. Uh, it may be true that Cannon aren't protected under the Second Amendment. It's certainly not true that, that Cannon weren't privately owned at the time of the founding. Um, it's also not true that Cannon aren't privately owned now. Look up the law. A lot of people have Cannon. You can buy them. You just said it's a tough call. What do you think, in, in, in Charles Cook's estimation, sir, should you sit on the United States Supreme Court? Which, by the way, off the top of my head, Charles, <laughs> I don't know if you can sit on the Supreme Court. You don't have to have a law I'll degree. I'll never be asked to, but I can. Yeah, I was going to say, you don't have to have a law degree, but do you have to be – you are an American citizen. Do you have to be a natural-born American citizen? I'm, ga- grant, I'm guessing you're, you know the answer, no. and it's no. You could be a Supreme Court justice. It's no. It's only okay. the president who has to be a natural-born American. Okay, so were you to sit on the United States Supreme Court, what do you think the limits of the Second Amendment are? Bazooka, grenade, um, increasing the the um, the magnitude of the firepower. How far does it go? It's difficult. I think the absolute outer reach would be a bazooka, and I think uh, out of a certain judicial modesty, if I was sitting on the Supreme Court, I would not find enough evidence in the historical record to strike down a law regulating or prohibiting bazookas. Um, I certainly think the AR-15 is protected for a couple of reasons. First, uh, if we take the historical text um, and meaning, and that's what Justice Thomas did in his recent Bruin opinion, uh, then you will find carbines covered under the definition of arms that was understood at the time of the founding, and the Second Amendment would therefore protect an AR-15 which is a carbine, um, also on precedential terms uh, with Heller, Heller protected weapons in common use. And there are mm-hmm. 21 million AR-15s in the United States. It's the most commonly owned rifle. So I, th- I think if that provision uh, within precedent is to have any force, and it should, then it obviously has to apply to uh, the AR-15. So, Charles, when I texted you and I said I want to talk to you, I, I told you I do want to do I do what we just did, and that's take the big picture based upon your, you know, your personal study and knowledge of of the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution. But I don't want to leave this conversation without asking you: What do you think of the gun control measure, the bipartisan gun control measure that brought into effect red flag laws, um, expanding background checks, the boyfriend loophole, and increasing funding for school safety? Um, what do you think of this step toward, and it is a step toward, if incremental, this step toward increased gun control? Well, I didn't like it at all for a number of reasons. First off, I didn't think we needed a federal response. Uh, I think that the promising areas here are the preserve of the states. Uh, second, I think it was really shoddily written. I think that was inevitable because it struck me as a list of items that senators could agree on rather than a list of items they believed in their soul were going to help very much. Um, the execution is poor. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot in there that, that is mystifying to me. For example, uh, it is now illegal for anyone with a juvenile record to buy a gun at any point in their life, uh, but not to possess a gun. Why? Nowhere else in law is that distinction drawn. I suspect they just forgot to put it in. Uh, The uh, rules governing those with misdemeanor uh, domestic assault convictions who are in serious relationships only counts for five years. Why? Where else in uh, firearms law do we say you're prohibited from buying a gun, but only for five years? Maybe we should do that. I'm not saying that's even a terrible idea. I don't know. I'd love to debate it, but they didn't. Uh, they just threw that in almost as if this was, a, you know, whatever is halfway between us must be correct kind of measure. And then they made some weird changes uh, that I would love to have known more about to, for example, what constitutes a federal firearms license. The changes look as if they substituted synonymous words. Did they? I don't know. I do know the Democrats have been trying to change that definition for years and have been unable to do so without statutory authority. Suddenly we see a statutory change. No one explains it. Um, And then, you know, with the funding, firstly, I just don't think that there is any state in the union that hasn't implemented a red flag law because it lacks the money. 
Is that the objection? No, it's not. And when you start throwing federal money around, you tend to start throwing federal strings around. Mm -hmm. And I don't like federal strings. I think if you're going to have red flag laws, then they need to be experimented with. They need to be tried and tested and altered. And when you have a federal government that is tying uh, money uh, to red flag laws, to mental health, um, uh, you know, to any sort of civil um, provisions such as that, uh, you make it that little bit harder uh, to, to experiment properly. So uh, I, I thought it was a mess. I, I, and I also, you know, I also don't think it's responsive. Um, it, one of the big problems we have in this country is that we just don't enforce a lot of the laws that we have. And I know people hate it when you say that because they think that it's a cop out, that you just don't want to talk about gun control. That's not true. I'm happy to talk about gun control all day. But you know, this bill in the Senate, it resubmitted the idea that straw purchasing is illegal. But that's not the problem. We already know that. It's just that we never go after straw purchases at the federal level, the state level, or in big cities. And that's because there is a, an unwillingness in progressive uh, circles to enforce laws uh, because, uh, you know, they believe that it's d there's disparate impact, that it's the school to prison pipeline, that we have an over incarceration problem. And so what we basically have in America now is this strange situation where conservatives say no to gun control on the front end and progressives say no to gun control on the back end, because even though they favor the laws, they don't want them to be enforced. And so what happens? We don't really have much gun control enforcement except on people who are already uh, obeying the law. Right. And it becomes exactly what everybody says. It's further increasing the restrictions and and legal oppression on law-abiding citizens. And although it's cliched, it doesn't do anything to stop the already um, dedicated lawbreaker. Uh, Charles, man, I do mean it. It's been way too long. And I, I hope that we can talk again about much more in American culture and politics uh, in the future together. Thank you, man. Of course. Anytime. Enjoyed it. Joey, glad to have you with me today. So you and I were hanging out the other day. We've done this a couple of times, commercial breaks during the show, having dinner the other night, and we end up talking about guns. Now, when it comes yeah. to the gun control measure passed by the United States House and Senate, it left behind the questions that I want to address with you today. What is a quote unquote assault weapon? But that doesn't mean that debate won't come back. And I find that it's a debate that is shrouded in the absolute most ignorance, perhaps of any aspect of gun control, which is absolutely covered in ignorance. So I wanted to inform today on the assault weapon, the assault rifle, the AR-15. And you are not just someone who used it in service, but you are also a gun enthusiast, so you're perfect today to inform our audience. So let's start with this. Tell me the difference between the gun, the rifle, that you used in service and an AR-15. Yeah, happily. And let me just say, 100%, 90% of what I know about guns, especially gun law, but also their their implementation is after military service. 10% of it I learned in military service. I learned how to take apart an AR-15. I learned the cycle of operations of a gas-operated weapon, very technical stuff. But I did not learn how to properly use a gun in any environment and in all the different types of ammunition and types of guns there are and mechanics for different guns and how they're used in American culture until I got out of the Marine Corps. And I point that out to say any civilian has the opportunity to understand and learn guns as much as anyone that's ever served. There isn't some big barrier there because some people kind of have this fallacy of, well, maybe military veterans and law enforcement should buy them, but regular civilians shouldn't. That's that's an absolute fallacy. Um, and I just want to point that out because I think it's important. I don't want to walk around with some uh, supposed credibility that I don't believe I have or, in, or some you know advantage that in our Second Amendment right that some people might say I have. It's just not true. As far as an AR-15 and what we would call an M4 carbine, um, they're essentially the same skeleton, but their function is very different. An AR-15 is a semi-automatic weapon. Every time that gun fires, you have to purposely squeeze the trigger. A An M4 or any variant of the AR platform used in military service has either select fire or full auto, which means you squeeze the trigger and multiple rounds come out. 
Um, those are two different weapons. They're 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 completely um, un- they're completely dissimilar at the point that you add select fire or full auto. They're actually used differently when they have that function. So full auto, I think most of the audience can fully understand what fully automatic means. You depress the trigger and bullets keep ejecting yeah. from the muzzle until you let go of the trigger. What is select fire? Select fire is a limited round. So for our military, it's a three-round burst. You squeeze the trigger, it fires three rounds and stops. And literally, that is because fully auto weapons aren't accurate. To fire fully auto, you can't be as accurate as one round at a time. So through either military research or some sort of conditioning research, our military landed on a three-round burst is the perfect cross between suppressive fire, which is putting enough bullets down range that the enemy doesn't have time to shoot back, and also accurate fire, which means some of those bullets actually kill your enemy. All right, and um, to distinguish again from the civilian most popular rifle in America in terms of sales, the AR-15 is a semi-automatic weapon, which is pull the trigger once, Mm -hmm. you get one bullet fired. Um, so are there fully automatic weapons out there in American mm-hmm. civilian use? Yeah, I don't remember the number off the top of my head. I, I'm landing in my head at like 500,000. It's into hundreds of thousands, but not a million. And these are fully automatic rifles. And in sometimes they're just the trigger that can be purchased and put into a rifle. And that's a different process. But across the board, there are less than a million fully automatic either rifles or parts that are serialized and put into a registry. Those weapons were registered prior to the, um, prior to the national firearms act, which is something that goes all the way back to the 1920s uh, prior to the uh, NFA, including fully automatic weapons into its limitations and prohibitions in the 1980s. I don't remember the the year exactly. It's around 84, I think. Um, And so what happened was, Congress passed back in the 1920s, they passed the National Firearms Act, which even in the 1920s was a $200 tax and whatever vetting process they had back then. And back then that was for um, short barreled rifles and suppressors. Um, And I'm not sure if they added fully automatic rifles back then. Uh, I don't believe so. The whole point of the National Firearms Act in the 1920s was to limit the Tommy guns used by the mobs in big cities. So they made it a $200 tax stamp to make it prohibitive uh, for a regular person to be able to purchase it. Um, And through the years, that law has been refined and amended, and now it's used to limit automatic weapons, short-barreled rifles, and suppressors. And when I say limit, what I mean by that is anybody can still own one of those three types of weapons. You can, I can, anyone that can pass a background check can. But it's a very extensive process, and the amount of time it takes to get approval varies from three months to a year and a half, depending on the resources and administrations willing to put into it, because it goes up through the ATF, the FBI, and then you get that tax stamp or certificate back. The reason why that's important is when we talk about fully automatic weapons, there are only so many out there. And it's the ones that were manufactured and put into circulation prior to the ban. So you can own a fully automatic weapon. You're going to pay twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars for the exact same M15 or AR15 I bought for six hundred dollars. You're going to pay twenty or thirty thousand dollars for a version of it that's fully auto. That's how different they are. That the value is tens of thousands of dollars difference. And from a constitutional perspective, I believe what that does, that prohibition is it creates a system to where rich people have more Second Amendment rights than poor people. And for the sake of the conversation of when it comes to gun control, we I want to say almost, but I think I can almost, I can declaratively say never hear of fully automatic weapons used, at least in terms of mass shootings. The only one that would be in anyone's recollection, at least the only one that's in my recollection, is the Las Vegas shooting. But that wasn't a fully automatic weapon. That was a semi-automatic rifle that was um, it was 
modified, they think, by the way, there's not much information around it, but they think was uh, using a bump stock feature, which is the stock continues to move with the, with the action of the rifle to make it appear as though it's automatic. I know there are people that have questions about exactly what happened in Las Vegas, but for the point of your and my conversation, you just don't hear about fully automatic rifles used in any of these mass shootings that we're attempting to control. No, and, and that argument... That fact supports both arguments when you really think about it. From one side, and listen, I'm an honest broker, Will. I don't sit here and tell you I believe in the Second Amendment for hunting or even self-defense. I tell you I believe in the Second Amendment because I think the framers of our Constitution understood the power that comes from having weapons. And they understood the people deserve to have that power. And the people having that power is one of the greatest checks and balances in our country. That is scary to some people. It's not promoting a revolution it's not even saying that a revolution is the ends to that means it's saying that there's something really special about a government recognizing its 330 million people have the right to own just as much power as those that could be tyrannical over them and to me that's an important thing that we should fight to protect doesn't mean we don't regulate it doesn't mean we don't ensure safety but we should fight to protect it. And so to go back to this idea of fully automatic weapons, where their place is in our culture, as opposed to the weapons that are readily available in most gun stores, at some point along the way, our Congress decided fully automatic weapons needed to be more regulated. And one of the biggest proponents of that is their their ineffectiveness. They are scatter guns. They do shoot indirect fire almost. They, they are used to suppress. So their ability to be accurate with them is very much diminished, and then public safety gets called into question. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I can I can understand the reasoning behind that argument. I believe that's the type of argument that just opens up a Pandora's box. But when we talk about mass shootings, a lot of times it's the same AR-15 that I have in my house. It's a 30-round magazine, multiple of them, um, and they're used in, in series in a situation like in Uvalde where – a good guy with a gun or a police or law enforcement officer doesn't get to them until they've already done whatever massacre they're going to do. Um, what we don't hear about, what isn't reported, are all the times that a good guy with a gun or a law enforcement officer prevents something like this even before it begins to happen. And that those numbers are much higher. And I don't know if we should – brag on that more or point it out more, but I think it should be a part of the conversation. It doesn't get to be because you can't prove a negative. And so if it never makes the headlines, you never know about it. Okay. So what we've done so far in this conversation is educate ourselves on the difference between the AR-15 and a quote unquote weapon of war. You hear that language used often when it comes to gun control. This is a weapon of war intended not for civilian, but for military use. Understanding the difference between fully automatic and select fire rifles and distinguishing that from a semi-automatic rifle is a major, major functional difference between what is, quote unquote, a weapon of war and, again, the most popular civilian rifle in America. Now, I want to ask you to distinguish the AR-15 from other rifles, Joey, that people would conceptually consider hunting rifles, bolt-action rifles, um, Mm -hmm. lever-action rifles, even, I I would assume, in some cases, even other semi-automatic rifles. Is there something about the AR base model gun that makes it more dangerous, more lethal than other American rifles? (laughs) <laughs> Let me put it to you this way. The big innovation in the last 15 years in the gun community has been to take the AR platform and adapt it to a caliber uh, of bullet that is suitable for hunting. And what I mean by that is the most common round used in an AR-15, that nomenclature is specific. AR-15 is specific to the bullet 5.56 or 223, 5.56 NATO. It's a small round. It is designed to scatter when it goes inside your body. This gun originally was manufactured as a lower-powered rifle that could carry more rounds once we realized that a lot of our combat was more close quarters than long range. And so the bullet size of what goes into an AR-15 is so much smaller that we don't hunt with it. The only people that do hunt with it are women that are getting into hunting, so they have a smaller frame and less experience, and younger children that uh, dads or, or even moms want to work their way up to it. Or, Joey, I would suggest you're hunting 
varmints. You're, you're shooting small yeah. game rodents, whatever it yeah. may be. Um, I want to just stop yeah. here for a second so that anybody listening that doesn't understand caliber can wrap our minds around this. Um, sure. And you correct me where I'm wrong, Joey, but a caliber is in essence the diameter of the bullet that a gun shoots. And most of the guns that you will have in your head in a popular usage are much bigger in caliber than the two twenty three used in the AR-15. So, for example... Even handguns, 9mm, 357, 45, these are all bigger calibered guns than the 223, which is the AR 15 round. So I just want to talk to you about that for one second because, again, what we're dealing with is this gun control conception that the AR 15 is more lethal. And is it fair to say, Joey, when it comes to the size of the bullet, it's not? It doesn't. You said it scatters, and I want to follow up on that. A 223 round shot from an AR-15, does it do more damage than, say, a 9 millimeter round shot from a handgun? No. It doesn't do more damage. Um, the biggest difference, and really I'd like to – I don't want to get too nerdy. I understand. But I think I can speak to this in words that anyone can understand. There are multiple aspects when it comes to defining what we call a round, a round of ammunition. And the reason why we call a round of ammunition a cartridge or a, or a package or a round rather than a bullet is that there's more parts and pieces and more thought that goes into it than just that piece of metal that comes out the end of the barrel. Right. So there are mainly three aspects of a bullet or, or, or a round, and that's the bullet itself, which is the piece of metal that we label the caliber after. And so that would be the first number in nomenclature. So if it's a 9 millimeter, it's 9 millimeters around as the bullet. Sometimes you'll have things like 30-06 or um, you'll have nomenclature for a bullet that describes both the size of the bullet and the size of the cartridge attached to it. And the cartridge attached to it is that piece of brass that spits out of the gun when you shoot it. Inside that piece of brass is black powder. And there are multiple types of black powder, and the amount of black powder tells you the basically the force of that bullet, which tells you how far it can travel. When you look at a 9-millimeter pistol round, it's only about three-quarters of an inch, maybe an inch long. Yeah, about an inch long. Then you look at a 5.56 five, rifle round, it's about two and a half inches long. But the 9-millimeter is much bigger round than the 5.56. Right. Five, so in one aspect, it's bigger. In another aspect, it's smaller. The reason why we don't get hung up on this is they have different purposes. A 5.56 right. five, round is meant to be uh, moderately effective, which means deadly enough, at a moderate distance, which means longer than short distance. A 5.56 five, round is literally designed to be medium, mediocre. The, 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 the most effective thing we can do that we can put more bullets down range, still be effective with them a little bit further out than a pistol, not quite as far out as the guns of old, which are thirty out six, three oh eight, M one Garands, some of the guns we've used in, in the past. So when we developed the the AR fifteen, we gave up a lot from what we normally used in war, but we gained effectiveness in the sense of we could carry more rounds, be more modular, shoot a little bit longer and a little bit shorter distances, shoot shoot uh, with our arms in tight to us. It was all about maneuverability, things of that nature. The reason why that's important to point out is all those hunting guns have come the same direction. All those bolt actions are using the same size round. We're never stopping our innovation. And so that line between an AR-15 and every other hunting gun out there has been blurred and will not stop being blurred. The difference is there's physical characteristics of an AR-15 that make them look scary. It doesn't necessarily make them more effective, but it makes them have a distinct look. And when people don't know anything about guns, they hone in on how something looks, not how it works, because they don't know any better. Okay, but let's deal with a couple of misconceptions there. So um, you said a moment ago that a um, an AR-15 round tumbles or splinters. You've heard that before. I think Joe Biden has said that. He said a lot of um, really ignorant things about guns, knocking <laughs> the lungs out of people. Or maybe he was talking about yeah. 9 millimeters on that. I don't know what he was yeah. talking about, the lung buster um, round. No. But um, so the the two twenty three uh, in civilian use, um, is it – you said, does it two two questions? I'll ask you at the same time. It travels faster feet per second than I think that's fair to say, right? Than the nine millimeter handgun round. Yes. 
it travels probably slower than the 30 out six or 270 traditional hunting round uh, while also being smaller, maybe it's faster than those rounds. You you can answer that. They're all but, they're all between about twenty five hundred and three thousand feet per second. I don't okay. know the exact uh, velocity uh, of each one. But this one isn't in particular faster than any other hunting rifle. Does no. it do anything different no. upon impact than any other hunting rifle? A thirty out six, you know, a two seventy. It depends on what type of ammunition you buy. There are multiple types of ammunition. Some are designed, like full metal jackets designed, you go into the body, and it kind of mushrooms out. So the end of it starts to peel away, and eventually pieces will split off. Some are more like a, a piercing. They shoot straight through. That's the biggest problem you have with a 5.56 five, is if it doesn't hit anything hard, a lot of times it'll just shoot straight through, and you have an entrance wound and an exit wound, and you don't have a lot of uh, – you don't kill somebody if you can shoot straight through them. I'll put it to you that way. So sometimes the biggest problem with the five, five, six when it comes to hunting is that animals have adrenaline and they have this this innate distinctive ability to survive even when we can't. You know, nature is their medicine. So if you just shoot a hole through them and nothing else is damaged, a deer will survive. You can shoot it through multiple parts of its body and it'll heal up and keep rocking. And that's why we use a bigger caliber that's a little bit slower sometimes, uh, but at least a bulkier so there's a better chance of it hitting something hard and doing right. what we want it to, which is to mushroom out and damage organs. And you can buy those variations, full metal jacket or whatever, in every different caliber. So what I'm getting at is Absolutely. we haven't yet found a distinguishing characteristic for the vilified exactly. AR-15. Not more Other than that it's less effective. <laughs> that's the, that's that's the right. distinguishing characteristic. That's right. Other than it's less effective than other rifles. It fires at the same rate of speed, the same effect upon impact at a smaller caliber bullet. Um, and you can buy variations in powder as well for all of these same rounds. So there's nothing yet we found about the AR-15 that has said to us this one is particularly lethal. Now, beyond the looks of it, which you started to allude to a minute ago, what about, Joey, all the things that – look, gun control opponents call cosmetic features. Gun control advocates would say increase the functionality that you described in making it more maneuverable in combat. Does any of that, whether it's, you know, you can uh, you can vary the, the size and length of the stock, you can add you can add things, you know, different kinds of sights, which you can with a regular hunting rifle as well. You can add all kinds of features to make it more comfortable. Does any in of the, that make it in more the lethal? Scenarios that we've seen, especially in school shootings, those features were irrelevant. And I think that's the important part. They didn't make the gun any easier to conceal. And none of these school shooters were doing close quarters combat, right? This was a – this was a. they used the element of surprise, the lack of security to take a rifle into a building and shoot a bunch of people. They weren't in combat with police officers trying to shoot their way out of it. Those cosmetic features like a collapsible bus stock or a pistol grip, those are important when it's you against someone else that's trained and you're both using your training – trying to fight your way out of it against another. That's not happened in these scenarios. More times than not, the bad guy shoots himself, and it usually is a young white male, so I say himself. Um, so none of those features that are cosmetic in nature, none of their functional purpose has been used effectively. Someone could have gone in with a traditional hunting stock, which is, just means there's not a pistol grip, the butt stock's of a certain length, and done exactly what all of these evil people have done, the, the, those distinctive features, cosmetic features that make an AR-15 and AR-15 have not been important. But we're going to be honest here, right? What's the one feature that we haven't talked about? It's interchangeable magazine, magazine capacity. Okay, let's come back to that in one second. But you said yeah. the other than magazine, the other feature that we would focus on would be the nature of the semi-automatic action. But there are semi-automatic actions available in almost every type of gun, meaning handguns, shotguns, rifles of various kind. I can buy a shotgun. I mean, it's very popular to buy a shotgun. You and I were talking the other day. I've always used a pump shotgun throughout my life. You mm -hmm. were telling me how much I needed to move to an automatic "Quote unquote automatic, a semi-automatic yeah. shotgun um, for for duck hunting." But the point yeah. is, pull the trigger and you you fire the gun is available in every yeah. model of gun. 
Absolutely. Uh, there are a lot of hunting rifles that are semi-automatic. I'd say uh, a lot of people use bolt-action rifles, not because they're more accurate or any more effective, just simply because it's nostalgia. Um, I, I know more people that use AR platform guns to hunt than not at this point. Because Really? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, mainly because what we hunt has changed. We like to hunt varmints and, and hogs and things like that now. Deer hunting is a little bit harder to do. Um, it's more of a rich man sport anymore is kind of what the rednecks would tell you. But also, it's just – it's just um, it, it's gun culture – understanding guns knows that whatever the tool is it's the it's the skill set of the person using it and their intent that matters i can take an ar-15 and go kill a deer with it because i understand weapons and guns and the chances of me taking a bad shot are much lower um so i'm not i I have no qualms over it your your traditional hunter doesn't shoot guns very often doesn't get a chance to go hunting very often two or three times a year he wants to bring the biggest thing he can out there that way if he takes a bad shot there's still a chance in in a harvest yeah and that's how i was raised by the way hunting two or three times a year for big game and it was bolt action and it was almost a sign of um of man manliness that why do you need more than one shot you shouldn't need me more than one shot so use a bolt action um, but that being said, so go back to the magazine. You said one distinguishing fi- f- uh, factor is the interchangeable 30 round magazine. That's it. I mean, that's, that's the center point of, of the debate. Um, that is a distinct feature that primarily tactical semi-automatic weapons have. Um, that doesn't mean that any number of hunting rifles don't have that ability. It's just not, it's not fashionable. It's not it's not generally practiced. There are high capacity magazines available for all those hunting guns that are semi automatic and take a magazine. There are even high capacity magazines available for bolt action rifles. It's just not um it's just not a part of how they're used. Why are there high capacity magazines for AR fifteens? For two reasons. One, for defensive purposes, if you need to have suppressive fire, you're in a situation where somebody is trying to kill you, you want to use every bullet you have available. And two, sport shooting. Um, which is a huge part of the industry, and it's a freedom we have. To take an AR-15, to train, to go to a safe range and compete against others, um, it's it's a part of that. So, as you said, you want to be an honest broker, and in all fairness, then, would you think that is a legitimate argument among gun controllers, that if you're trying to make these school shootings less catastrophic, um, then one thing you could focus on is – the potential size of the magazine. It is the only distinguishable feature that you and I in this conversation have identified. Then therefore is is it a legitimate point of focus for gun control? And this is where, this is where the lack of honesty from those involved in making policy really affect everything. There are a lot of gun control measures that on their face don't sound terrible. The problem is we understand Changing those rules does not prevent these things from happening. Only focusing on those things certainly doesn't prevent these things from happening. And as soon as we pass a piece of legislation that, say, puts high-capacity magazines into the National Firearms Act, which means you have to go through a more stringent process to acquire one, well, as soon as we change that law, another tragedy happens. So then the response from those that are for gun control say, well, that didn't work. Let's do something else. Let's do more. That's the fear, and that's the problem. The other thing is, out of every part and piece on that gun, the easiest thing to modify or make yourself would be the magazine. So it would be much more a sign of – it would be much more a posture than a pragmatic solution. Um, So what I mean by that is much of the gun control argument is built around optics and feeling safe. That sounds like it would work, so let's do that. But the the fact is there are hundreds of millions more guns in this country than there are people. We do have a Second Amendment that our Supreme Court has continued to uphold. Guns are and will be a part of our culture until the day that we make an amendment to the Constitution and literally confiscate and destroy every gun in this country. And I don't think our country is in that place. It may get there one day, but I don't think that's where we are today. So as long as guns are a part of our culture, as long as there are hundreds of millions of guns in this country – The laws that specifically focus on those that already obey the rules to the very least aren't enough and I would argue aren't effective at all. 
All right, Lynn, let's end this conversation with a question that has been as difficult to answer as the most popular question in America. The most popular question in America is what is a woman? For this conversation, one that is just as difficult to answer, what is an assault weapon? It's a weapon you use to assault people with. <laughs> so a hammer. Everything. Listen, um, <laughs> A bolt action rifle is more deadly in my hands than the hands of someone that was born and raised in Brooklyn and has never touched a gun that gets a hold of an AR-15. Um, your, your, like I said at the beginning of this conversation, your skill set and intent define what that weapon is in that moment. Um, and that's the problem we have is we, yeah. we don't focus on that. We don't focus on intent. Yeah, and I and I think what I wanted to accomplish in this conversation with you is to shine light on something where there's been a ton of ignorance because it relies on the concept of catchphrases. And the the bottom line is there is no definition to what is an assault weapon. Yeah, um, it is something, and you alluded to it earlier, that looks scary, uh, that looks like a quote unquote weapon of war. But in true functionality, there isn't a distinguishing feature of what people mean when they say assault weapon that makes it different from the vast majority of guns in circulation other than its comfort and its looks. You know, one thing I wanted to, I didn't want to gloss over. You brought up at the beginning of this conversation, the legislation that was just passed and, um, I've been traveling, so I have to update myself. I don't know if the House has passed it yet. I know it passed the Senate. It'll get rubber stamped in the House, and, and the president will sign it. I don't know where we are today in that in that line of secession. If you look at that legislation, here's what I'll tell you. I don't, I don't think it's helpful. I wouldn't advocate for it. There are things about it I have true questions on. But if we want our government to work in compromise, that goes both ways. As a conservative, I say I want the work, government to work in compromise because I don't want the Democrats to spend $3 trillion. I'd rather them only spend $500 billion. So compromise with us and bring that number down. All right? Even though I don't like that $500 billion, that's a whole lot better than $3 trillion. What's so scary to the gun community on the word compromise is we do not believe Democrats are honest brokers, and we feel like every inch we give is, an, is a mile waiting to happen. But if you look at this legislation, it doesn't – create federal regulation around any of the scariest parts. Like it doesn't codify red flag laws. It provides funding for states that choose red flag laws. So it does put much of this in the hands of the state, which as a conservative I, I can support. So would I, would I want this legislation to pass? No. Why? Mainly because I don't think it's overly effective, but the fact that it is as balanced with just as much or more focus on, securing schools, uh, mental health checks, things that aren't just about taking guns away from law-abiding citizens. What that tells me is that the Democrats in Congress understand and know regular Americans aren't on board with taking away guns and banning ARs and limiting our access as law-abiding citizens to guns. That's just not where the American people are. The gun sales and where the sales have spikes show that. Polls show that. You'll see a poll that says Americans support universal background checks, but you won't see the poll where they ask Americans what that means. You won't see a poll that shows that they understand that. Because if you ask them, should a father be able to give a gun to his son? Should a best friend be able to sell a gun to his other best friend who's known his whole life and is a police officer or a fireman or a school teacher? They're probably going to answer differently there. So they don't understand universal background checks. And they don't understand the concerns the gun community has over universal background checks. So we could go line by line. And I don't mean to hog up a bunch of time here, but the point is the American people – they 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 have doctorates and common sense, and they understand that gun ownership is not felonies waiting to happen. All right, man. I appreciate you bringing us some insight, knowledge, and common sense here today. Thank you, Joey. Absolutely, brother. Thank you, Katie. I'm really happy to have you on the podcast today. Here is the plan for our conversation. I told you this during the break just a few moments ago that I wanted to sort of. Instead of straw man our opponent's argument, I wanted to steel man our opponent's argument. I wanted to represent their positions in the best light. And you said to me, by the way, before we came on camera, well, doesn't the media already do that? I said, yes, but I think most people involved in the gun debate are ignorant about not just the functionality of the gun, but the laws we have on the books. So today, together, 
I would love for us to tackle red flag laws and background checks, giving our opponents the best shake we can manage. Deal? I'm game. Let's do it. (laughs) Okay. Let's start with where there seems to be, at least on Capitol Hill, some bipartisan agreement. Let's start with the concept of red flag laws. Senate Republicans seem to think this is somewhere they can come to an agreement with Democrats. What do you think of red flag laws? Well, first, we should probably explain what the basic concept of a red flag law is. So essentially what it allows a guardian, a parent, a family member, or maybe a significant other to do is if they see uh, someone that they know has firearms as they believe they'll be a danger to themselves or to other people, they can go to a judge with evidence of what they think that danger is. And the evidence bar is different depending on the state and say, I believe this person is going to be a danger and therefore their gun should be taken from them by the authorities. So that's the basic concept for a red, a red flag law. That sounds like, uh, you know, something that could be reasonable. If, if you feel like someone is going to cause harm to themselves or to you or to other people that you would have a mechanism to go to law enforcement to be able to take away something from them. The problem with red flag laws is that it, it immediately takes away a uh, real due process. So it's an accusation that's thrown out to a judge or the police. Uh, and as I said, the bar for evidence, depending on which state you're in can be very low. And there's a lot of room for, uh, for abuse. So we've seen a number of instances of abuse in more liberal states like New York and New Jersey, for example. So I'm generally opposed to them because the government does not write them in a way that takes away that abuse and protects the constitutional rights of the person who is being red flagged. Um, But also, I think federally, as Congress decides, is is debating uh, implementing a red flag law through funding to the states to come up with their own pieces of legislation. I don't think that there's enough trust given how the left has used government institutions, including law enforcement like the FBI, to target their political opponents. And just this week, we saw uh, Congressman Eric Swalwell saying that he wanted to red flag Ben Shapiro uh, because of something that he said on his radio program. So um, generally, against them uh, and think that they are rife for abuse and that constitutionality of what they require uh, should be a bigger debate. Okay, so you begin to lay out, I think, an appropriate philosophical objection to red flag laws. Again, let's start with the place of agreement. I think that everyone on both sides of the gun debate wants to keep guns out of the hands of people who would do harm, commit crimes with guns, whether or not they're a Democrat or Republican, a gun control advocate or a gun rights defender. No one wants guns in the hands of someone who is prepared to do ill with that gun. Um, And we'll talk in a moment about background checks and how that applies to criminality. But right now, what we're talking about when it comes to red flag laws is mental health. And I want to come back Mm -hmm. to philosophy in just one moment. But we start really from a place of agreement. Because after every mass shooting, Republicans do focus on mental health, I think rightfully. They focus on what are we doing to help those that have found themselves or identify those who have found themselves in this this extremely deteriorated or evil position in life. And the red flag law says, well, let's keep guns out of their hands. But let's talk about the practical application of that. How do we identify who's mentally unhealthy? How do we identify sort of in like a pre-crime mindset Who's going to do ill with a gun? Well, that's exactly the question, right? Uh, and I should should say, uh, just following up on what I just said in your first question, just because you agree with a concept doesn't mean that it's the government's job or that the government has even the ability to implement um, the concept or to make sure that it's implemented properly. So there's a lot of great ideas out there, but the government, whether it's local or federal, isn't always the best vehicle. In fact, sometimes it's a terrible vehicle to actually do something and change things for the better. Um, But when it comes to this concept of, you know, basically telling, accusing someone of something, in this case of being a danger to others because they own firearms and therefore they should be taken away from them, they're, you're, the due process is you're guilty first and innocent later. You have to go back to court and prove why you, as someone who hasn't broken any laws, 
um, should be able to have your Second Amendment rights back. And that is a concept that the left generally approves of. We're seeing a number of Republicans uh, get on board with that idea by supporting this red flag law. Um, I, you know, there's these legislation that we saw in Florida, for example, after Parkland. Um, but this idea that in America you are guilty until proven innocent is not how our system works and for good reason. And, you know, we're, we're focused on the issue of gun control, um, but that can, of course, balloon itself into other issues down the road. You know, the slippery slope argument of this being, if you throw it under the bus now, good luck getting it back from the government later. So you're staying on the philosophical side of this argument, which is fine, because I want to talk about the philosophical side as well. So you think you're rightfully pointing out what we're talking about is a reversal of the concept of due process. Lose your rights first, make your argument then to regain your rights. And it also, I'd have to think, puts just a ton of power into the hands of, first of all, family members who are often, look, we're playing in the realm of whether or not, A, this would work to solve a crime, and we'll get to that, the practical applications in just a moment, but but B, whether or not the cost-benefit side of it, should it work in some instances, be outweighed by the cost side. And so, you know, there's family fights all the time. So what keeps a family member from going in and saying, hey, so-and-so's lost their mind, they've posted this. It puts a lot of hands in the power of a spouse or a mother or father, or for that matter, a psychiatrist, right? I mean, we're going to be turning to people to determine whether or not these people are mentally ill. And uh, by the way, when it comes to a profession that's then going to be handed a ton of power, like psychiatry, I mean, these are people overwhelmingly on the left, and I would also Mm -hmm. assume probably by extension there, overwhelmingly in support of gun control. Yeah, and that's exactly the question. Um, you know, they would argue that if you write the legislation properly, that you, it requires a certain amount of evidence to take to a judge who would then, again, as a person, uh, determine whether the evidence meets the standard for going and taking away someone's lawfully acquired firearms. And, you know, there are periods of how long they can t- hold them, what the requirements are to go get them back. Um, but you're right, you have to, you're interjecting uh, another person or multiple people, whether it's a family member, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, um, a parent, uh, anybody really can go to the court and have those rights uh, taken away from you. And, you know, that is abused a lot. And and you see that um, just in, in culture. And there are a number of real life situations where we've seen these red flags, uh, flag laws, completely abused. And now you can say also, if you implement uh, consequences for people who abuse them, then it will cut down on on that too. And I think that if they're going to implement these laws in places, they should certainly implement penalties for people who lie um, to try and get people's firearms taken away. But going back to the concept of, so who applies, right? Uh, if you think someone is mentally ill, well, first of all, um, in this country, there are millions of veterans who have PTSD. Uh, and so are you going to say that if you're a veteran who served your country and you happen to go get mental health care, um, that you need and should seek that, that disqualifies you from owning a firearm or it sets you up for, uh, you know, being a a victim of this red flag law bureaucracy that Mm -hmm. will inevitably be built as a result. Um, you know, we just came out of a pandemic where uh, a lot of people in this country and including a lot of really powerful people in positions of government thought that people who didn't want to get vaccinated were uh, mentally uh, uh, mentally ill. Uh, and so what is the standard? Is the standard, you know, being we medically know, diagnosed? By the way, is this- <laughs> we know, by the way, there are people who we know the rates of, for example, depression are incredibly mm-hmm. on the rise. And this isn't simply about this. You know, Katie, this wouldn't end up being just about, for example, mass shootings. It would also be about because I, I believe is it half or a third of total gun deaths in this country on a year to year basis are actually due to suicide? So so here we are in the wake of the pandemic. Depression is on the rise. Can someone have their gun rights taken away because a family member reports it to a judge? A psychiatrist backs it up that this person is clinically depressed. Therefore, they have no Second Amendment right. Right. And that that's exactly the point is we're not dealing with um, an issue that is is simple or easy. We're dealing with 
rights that we have naturally as human beings, the ability to defend ourselves, to keep and bear arms, to defend our families. Um, but it is in the Constitution. And I think in the last two years, we've seen a lot of arguments being made that just kind of push the Constitution away, whether it's being able to go to church on Sunday with your congregation because of COVID rules or other issues. And so when it comes to constitutional rights, you have to be especially careful with what you brought up, which is the cost benefit analysis of the risk that mm-hmm. you're taking what, by implementing these kinds of, of, of laws. And so that's, you know, again, the government would argue and people who support this would argue they can very carefully write the law so that there are high standards or punishment for people who abuse it. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't prevent those things from happening because people who want to do harm, whether it's lying about some, taking away someone's firearms or going up to shoot a school, don't follow the rules or the laws. So you know, yeah. those are the concerns that people have. And I don't, again, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm reminding myself in this moment, I want to give those, my, I hate to use the word, but our opponents, I want to give them the strongest possible argument. But again, I just don't know how it's philosophically sound and practically applicable because you, we pointed out there are legitimate, there's legitimately people dealing with mental health disorders in this country. Does that mean they are dangers to themselves or others? That's not necessarily an X, Y no. connection, right? You're, you're exactly. maligning all of the mentally ill. You know what else you're doing? There are millions of people in this country who say crazy stuff on the internet, like crazy stuff. So well. does that mean they're legitimately people who should be relinquishing their second amendment rights? Well, and then you have a battle between the First Amendment and the Second Amendment, right? Like, well, the First Amendment covers a lot of ground with what you're allowed to say. There's things that you can't say. You can't say you're going to go kill someone and, you know, not expect maybe a consequence for that, um, which you would argue is a good thing. (laughs) But you also can't say that if you dislike someone that you should take their firearms away, just like we saw with Congressman Swalwell saying about Ben Shapiro, right? So. Um, right. Speech in this country has become something that the left really doesn't like. They believe that speech is violence. Uh, so if you're using what people say as an example of why their Second Amendment rights should be taken away, uh, again, that opens up the door to millions of people <laughs> being put into this category that is rife for abuse with um people who have political agendas rather than gun safety uh, standards. And I would flip this on its head, actually, because we see all the time, like in places like New Jersey and New York, for example, that they have all these gun control laws in place, including having to wait um, to get concealed carry permits. The same thing happened in Washington, D.C. I, at one point, had a federal stalking case open on a stalker who had threatened to kill former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. He went to prison for it. And I had all of this documentation. They still would not approve my concealed carry permit in Washington, D.C. until the hundredth day. And they would argue that, look, we're protecting people from going and getting a, a firearm or carrying a firearm and doing something that they may regret. And we're making sure that there's a cooling off period or a waiting period. Well, people have died as a result of that waiting period. Uh, and in the government, it's always the, the government arguing that they are they are doing the best for everybody by preventing a lawful person from going to get that concealed carry permit um, that they need to protect themselves. And, and that's their argument. Well, the risk benefit reward is that you might not be able to get your firearm, but we're protecting everybody else because you don't have one. You can flip that over with red flag laws on the opposite side, right, where you're saying, well, we're protecting all these people by having red flag laws. And it's fine because we're taking away the rights of the people who are getting red flagged and having to be guilty rather than innocent first. And maybe they're not guilty, but we'd rather be safe than sorry. I think that's a really bad standard when it comes to people's personal safety, but also just constitutionally. um, It does. You know, why is it that certain people should have their constitutional rights taken away because the government thinks that they'll benefit other, you know, the masses? I think it's a pretty unfair and unjust standard and, again, unconstitutional. All right. So we've both weighed the cost side of it, though. We need to also assess the benefit side of it. So for those that would support the red flag law, they would say, well, here's Salvador Ramos, who who in the Uvalde shooter instance had posted stuff on the Internet, had told 
someone, and I don't think there was much time, I think he only told her an hour or two ahead of time, but somebody in Germany that he was talking to on social media that he was going to shoot up a school. But he had in the past posted photos of dead cats. He had done things that you would say might flag him with a red flag if a family member would have turned him in. So would a red flag law help stop Salvador Ramos? Uh, The answer is no, because the so-called red flag on him would have been, you know, if some adult in his life who had failed him, whether it was his mom who was doing drugs or his grandparents and his grandfather, who was also a prohibited possessor of firearms, were looking at his phone and seeing that he was posting pictures of himself with a bag of dead cats. That's the red flag is to see that and say, okay, clearly this kid needs some help. There's something wrong. Um, he, He... went, as you mentioned, and bought the firearms and then immediately went to go carry out his crime. So a red flag law wouldn't have been applicable because it applies to people who already have firearms in their possession. Um, So it wouldn't have been applicable in this situation. And so, you know, in the aftermath of these horrific events, there's always this push to, quote, do something, which is understandable given the horrific situation or situations that we've seen. However, most of the time, policy positions or laws that would that are not applicable to the current situation that is being used to push for more laws um, doesn't apply. And so does you know and the, the, the bottom line too is the concept is the government cannot solve every single problem. The government has an obligation to do what right. it can to, to to prevent loss of life, of course. Um, but the solution in, in Uvalde, I would say, isn't a government solution at all. It's having someone who is an adult in your family who can pay attention to what you're posting on social media and get you help. Um, it's having yeah. people in the home who can, you know, get you to school and get you into an environment where you don't feel like you need to um, carry out this type of situation. And so, you know, if you look at the levels of failure in Uvalde, and this is actually mo- the case a lot of times in other places where these things have happened, um, there's, there's so many layers of failure along the way. And if you're just going to say we can slap a federal flag, red flag law, law on or implement some different kind of gun control, that that's going to fix the problem. I just think that that's dishonest. Um, and it's just not true. And a lot of the time politicians in Washington are saying, well, we're doing something. And it's like, OK, but you're not doing something that actually would have solved the problem. You're doing it for the sake of saying you did something, um, which to be means clear, we just go in the cycle. Yeah, yeah of doing something, even if it doesn't resolve the something that just happened. Um, So, but to be clear, so the red flag law would, would serve to have Salvador Ramos, had he been red flagged by a family member who then was approved by a court under this, this new concept, this new law would have served to take his guns away, but it wouldn't have put him into a system where he's red flagged. And when he went in to buy the gun, they would have denied him the purchase. That's not how it would have worked, Katie. Uh, I think it just depends on what, you know, what I, I, I think I have to look at the way the law is written, but the concept is people who are already in possession of firearms who have them. Mm. And do you think that they're going to do themselves or other people harm? I, I don't believe that it, um, and I'd have to look this up because I actually don't know the answer to your question, but I don't believe that it would prevent you from passing a background check because a background check is specifically about your criminal record. Uh, it's not about, um, you know, you're, you haven't your mental health status. Right. It's yeah. not about your mental. Well, I mean, they do ask on your background check form if you've ever been committed to an institution. And if you say yes, then you are not eligible to pass a background check. Um, so that question is there, but it's about specifically right. being committed to an institution. So and I, and I think um, I think there's also a timing issue as well on the concept that a red flag mm-hmm. law could help stop something like Salvador Ramos. You'd have to you'd have to flag him early, get to a court, get the law implemented when I think a lot of these times you're talking about a week or something like that, where a guy starts really letting people know he's in this situation. And it could be longer in some instances. Again, I want to be fair. Some of these people may may be telegraphing this for a long time. They may be telegraphing. And you know what? I think Ramos tried to buy a gun a year before when he was 17. Mm -hmm. So maybe, but, but all the ultimate filter for the red flag is the family member, you know, and that, that didn't exist in his life. You brought up background checks. That's another thing that's that's often brought up in this. 
Um, now, here's the argument. 90% of people support expanding background checks. Um, and we should, we should same way you laid out uh, red flag laws, we should lay out background checks. Mm-hmm. 78% of gun purchases are subjected to background checks. If you buy a gun from a dealer, from a store, you're, you're – you're submitting yourself to a background check. It's if I buy a gun from Katie, it's private sales. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the law is, by the way, in Virginia, in Texas. I know mm-hmm. I can buy a gun from a friend and I don't have to go through a background check, which I believe amounts to about 22% of, of gun purchases. So the argument is, okay, we need to make that universal. And the polls that are touted say 90% of people are in on that. And what say you? Well, first I would say, um, I I believe in expanding the background check system in this sense. I do believe that juvenile criminal records should be put into the national background check system because what happens is if you, you have a violent criminal record as a juvenile, your record essentially gets expunged when you're 18 and you then can go on without that on your record. Now, if you've had a, a violent history as a juvenile and there, you know, I think that that could be something that could, could absolutely be applicable to the background check system, meaning when you turn 18, it doesn't get expunged. If you're applying to buy a gun, that system gets to look into your juvenile record um, for any kind of violent history. Now, you have to be careful about that, because if you shoplifted at the store, that maybe shouldn't be something that precludes you from your Second Amendment rights for the rest of your life. And obviously, felonies are the standard for not being able to purchase a firearm or to vote in this country. Um, But in terms of the question about 90% of people agreeing with expanding background checks, a lot of the time the way that the media talks about this and the concept people have of background checks is they say, well, we need background checks. The FBI does 25 million background checks every single year. And when you dig into the data about the person-to-person sales, and there's been tons of studies on this, people going into prison systems and asking the criminals where they get their guns, um, they're not getting them at gun shows. They're not getting them from a lawful family member. And we already have rules on the books that say, if you're selling a gun to a person who is not legally allowed to purchase one through a federally licensed firearms dealer, that's a felony for you and it's a felony for them. So there are already laws in place to prevent and mitigate this. And I think the concept that the left likes about this idea is that if I'm a dad, I can't just hand my gun down to my son. It also creates a lot of problems when people go out to the range about borrowing guns, um, you know, giving a gun to a neighbor and whether that is something that would be covered under these new laws. And Mm -hmm. so um, the people who are, you know, the, 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 the kid in Uvalde passed a lawful background check. Okay, so again, here we are with this idea that we're trying to push a solution onto uh, a situation where it wouldn't have been applicable in the first place. Yeah, and and again, I I really am trying to be fair, but if you look at what what normally drives these conversations is the mass shooter incident. You point out Mm -hmm. in Uvalde, he passed a background check in Sandy Hook. He didn't take a background check because he didn't purchase a gun. He just went and grabbed his mother's gun. A ba- expanded yep. background checks would have done nothing for that. I can't remember what happened in Parkland. I can't remember how that guy um, got his gun. But the vast majority of time, what you're talking about is criminals will get guns in illegal ways, and background checks don't catch. And, and by the way, on the note of the criminals, if we're really focusing on most of the gun crime, we're we're focusing on gun violence. I mean, uh, gang violence. Mm-hmm. I mean, the vast yes. majority of, of gun crime is gang violence. And those guys aren't going to Dick Sporting Good and taking a background check. So what is the background check catching to expand? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think there's anything left to, to catch. I mean, the background check system now, I think, is as decent as you can possibly get it outside of maybe putting in juvenile records. I mean, you there are questions about drug use, right. which we know Hunter Biden ignored. Um, there are questions about criminal history. And the way the background check system ha- which works, and it actually is better in some states than others, because it's like garbage in, garbage out, or good information good in, good information out. So for example, the Navy Yard shooter here in Washington, D.C., he passed a background check in Virginia, but he shouldn't have passed a background check because he used to live in New Hampshire and New Hampshire didn't put his mental um, institu- is institutionalized. He was he was committed to a mental health institution records into the background check system in New Hampshire. So hmm. he didn't catch on the federal system. So he shouldn't have passed a background check in Virginia. But if the states don't do their part 
and put the information the system needs to check people. It's kind of like coming here from Afghanistan and not having any papers. <laughs> yeah, if you came after the fall of Afghanistan and they say, oh, well, everyone is, was, was properly vetted. Well, if you don't have any paperwork, how can you say that the person was properly vetted? It's kind of the same concept. If there's nothing to push up against and there's no information, then the system goes through. So the NRA and actually the National Shooting Sports Foundation are the ones who have worked on getting the background check system up and running and to really encourage states to do a better job. And there's been grant programs in the past and through legislation like Fix Nix, for example, where states get more uh, funding to be able to put their background checks into the system so that if you buy a gun in a different state and have a criminal record, for example, that you're not able um, to do that. And we've seen that in a number of these cases as well with the um, the Charlottesville uh, or sorry, the uh, Charleston church shooting. That guy was, you know, shouldn't have passed a background check. And a number of times these people have been on the FBI's radar. So, um, you know, not every situation is going to be different, but we have to come back to the data. There's an amazing study by the National Institute of Justice, which is a, which is underneath the jurisdiction of the Department of Justice, that has all the statistics about uh, school shootings, mass shootings since the 1970s. Uh, and if you look at the data, 92% of school shooters uh, under in elementary to, through high school were suicidal at the time they committed their crimes. Suicidal. And so that tells you more about what the problem mm. is than the, the, the firearms. And 70%, 77% of um, in, in, in uh, the, the shootings since the 1970s, 77% of them have been carried out with handguns, not with semi-automatic rifles. Um, so again, right. you know, you have Congress very focused on semi-automatic rifles. Um, and the FBI data shows that more criminals use hands, fists, hammers, and blunt objects every year to kill people than they do um semi-automatic rifles so when you're talking about policy and big pieces of legislation that kind of data really matters and it shows you what the problem is but unfortunately it seems to be ignored in favor of doing something based on how right. people may feel about certain legislation or certain types of firearms well it looks like we could improve background checks the red flag laws present some real concerns on the cost benefit analysis and can't just be simply accepted under the banner of do something. All right, Katie Pavlich, always good to talk to you. Thank you for enlightening Thanks, us well. on these issues. All right. Hope to see you soon. Thanks, Thank Katie. You. Hey, it's Will Kane. Click here to subscribe to the Fox News channel on YouTube. It's the best way to get our latest interviews and highlights. And click to subscribe to the Will Kane podcast for full episodes right now.